Saudi Arabia has a message. Enough. This is the word that we want the whole world to hear. Enough terror, enough violence, enough crushing of our lives and our tomorrows. The kingdom says it's going to lead a regional fight against terrorism and believes a new Islamic military counter-terrorism coalition is the answer. Last week, its members met for the first time, two years after Mohammed bin Salman founded the alliance while he was defense minister. Now, as Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman says he's responding to repeated Western calls for the region to take a stand against extremism. And he even has the backing of the Arab League. The thinking, the ideological thinking, the uh, educational system, the economic, the social, this is a comprehensive approach to get rid of uh, terrorism. And definitely such an alliance that was announced by Saudi Arabia is very much welcomed. The Islamic Military Counter-Terrorism Coalition says it will foster political, financial, and military cooperation between its 41 members. They include Egypt, the UAE, Bahrain, Afghanistan, Uganda, Somalia, Lebanon, Libya, Yemen, and Turkey. But not every regional player was invited. Iran and its allies, Syria and Iraq, were left out. Qatar, which has been isolated by Saudi Arabia and its allies over alleged ties to terrorism, did not attend, despite being a member. Critics say there's an obvious exclusion of Saudi Arabia's enemies, something the coalition denies. I've uh, mentioned it a number of times, and I'll say it clearly, this coalition is uh, against terrorism. It is not against any country, sect, or religion. But with Daesh all but defeated in Iraq and Syria, who will the alliance target next? Some of its members have different views on groups like Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood, Lebanon's Hezbollah, and the Palestinian group Hamas. Critics are also dismissing the alliance as a propaganda exercise by Saudi Arabia, while ignoring its own Wahhabi ideology that gave rise to groups like Daesh, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban. There are questions, too, about just how far the alliance members will cooperate on the ground and whether it will flex its military muscle in its own neighborhood in the same way that NATO has. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined from Tehran by Iran foreign policy expert Mohammed Marandi and from Medina, Saudi Arabia, is Aisha Sadiqa. She's a military expert and Middle East researcher at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. Mohammed Marandi, did it annoy you that Iran was not invited to join the Islamic Military Counter-Terrorism Coalition? No, I don't think anyone in Iran was annoyed. No one at all took it seriously. The Saudis um, have uh, trouble enough uh, with regards to fighting and attacking the poorest country in the world, meaning Yemen. And the only way in which the Saudis can hurt the Yemenis is by forcing starvation upon them, of course, with the help of the United States and its other Western uh, friends. So, no, I don't think anyone really sees it as an important chapter in the current state of affairs in the region. I think what does concern Iran is the way in which the Saudis are uh, losing control. Uh, they are behaving erratically, not only in Yemen. The, the failed coup, of course, was another blow to the Saudi regime. Their outrageous behavior towards Qatar and the attempt to strangle the country, which fortunately failed. The humiliation of the Lebanese prime minister, who was funded and supported by the Saudis for, for many years. And uh, the list goes on. Uh, the Saudis right. have been uh, failing across the board. And of course, the internal situation for Saudi Arabia, the arrest of hundreds of princes a week after uh, a conference uh, held at the Ritz. And then they hold this, these princes in the same hotel which says a lot to foreign investors okay. and also okay, Saudi so investors. Okay, fair enough. So you've listed a, a bunch of problems you have. Mohammed Al-Yahya, I want to 
bring it back to the alliance just for a second now and bring in Aisha Sadiqa because I think Pakistan tells an interesting story about this alliance. Are the Pakistanis caught in the middle a little bit here? They've signed up, but at a time when their foreign minister, your foreign minister, has told me as well that Pakistan is pivoting towards the Iranians and others in the region. How is Pakistan going to do this balancing act? Isn't it caught in the middle between the Saudis and the Iranians? Certainly, uh, that is the case. Pakistan is caught in the middle. And, you know, the public perspective is that we don't want to be fighting Saudi wars. Uh, Pakistan does not want, and it's sensitive towards Iran. Uh, traditionally, Pakistan, the longest relationship Pakistan has had, and I would say very strategic, is with Saudi Arabia. Yet, there is very little uh, appetite for fire fighting Saudi Arabia's war. Uh, you know, that is the, the, the situation. However, uh, you know, being caught in the middle uh, really means that we have about seven to 12,000 troops in Saudi Arabia. We have a former army chief. And people are utterly confused. We were brought into the alliance. Pakistan was brought into the alliance. Uh, you know, it was ordered into an alliance, not asked or negotiated. I mean, one day, even the foreign office was caught by surprise when it was announced that mm -hmm. Pakistan will be a member. And then, you know, Pakistan walked in. Uh, I think what it feels, what it tried to do uh, was to kind of balance. It's going to be difficult. Uh, and I don't know how far will it, uh, Pakistan will be able to deliver without damaging its relations with Iran yep. or damaging the yep. reputation of uh, what the military is doing um, in the region. Yeah, but interestingly, I mean, just, just to be clear, because I want to be absolutely certain I understand what you're saying here, because you have General Raheel Sharif, who's going to be the top dog. He's going to be the military commander. He's Pakistani, former uh, military head. Are you saying that Pakistan yeah. is an unwilling participant, or it might have been strong-armed into this? I think Pakistan is a very reluctant participant into it. Raheel Sharif is there, but when you talk to people, uh, the idea that is given, the myth that is built around it is that here is a retired general, it's a private job that he's doing, uh, he's trying to fix things, uh, and the Arabs are very impressed, the Saudis are very impressed by his capacity to fight uh, terrorism at home, and that's why he's there. But beyond that, there is no discussion, and beyond that, by the way, there is absolutely no appetite. Uh, I mean, when you look at the current situation, there is a there is a greater expectation in Pakistan to Saudi for Saudi Arabia to do something much more concrete with this coalition vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel, uh, you know, especially mm -hmm. uh, you know the Jerusalem case. And I think right now there is a lot of bitterness amongst uh, the national security community who are talking, you know, who kind of don't see who have much expectation of this coalition, except right. that here is the former general doing the job. Okay, so Mohammed Marandi, let me ask you if you think there's a sectarian element here, because looking at the politics, you might say, okay, fine, we can half understand why maybe Syria was not invited. It's plunged in a terrible war and hundreds of thousands of people have died. You can maybe even half understand why the Qataris have not been invited because there's an ongoing isolation of the Qataris. But you look at Iran and you look at its ally Iraq as well. Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's not. But do you think that this is a bunch of mainly Sunni allies ganging up on Shias? Well, that's what the Saudis would like people to think. I mean, their occupation of Bahrain is another uh, atrocity in the list of uh, acts of the Saudi regime. Uh, and so the Saudis would like people to think that. They've been funding... ISIS and Al-Qaeda, as we know from the WikiLeaks documents, Hillary Clinton, we know from the Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012. We know that the Saudis have been funding all these extremist groups because they promote the Wahhabi ideology, and the Wahhabi ideology is the ideology of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and, and others. And that's exactly the point, actually, that Sunni Islam has nothing to do with Wahhabism. Wahhabism is something distinct. And that is a product from Najd, from Saudi Arabia, which has only grown because of Saudi oil wealth, which is, which is rapidly coming to an end, by, by the way, because the, the amount of money that the Saudis are spending in, in, in Yemen 
and uh, through their other crises that they've created, self-inflicted crises is, is extraordinary, okay. and this simply cannot continue. But Mohammed, might it be, might so it no, be defensive? No, I don't think so, and I think that, for example, what, what they enough. did... Finish your point, finish your point, and then I'll, I'll come in. Finish your point. Yes, I was saying that uh, in the case of Qatar, for example, that you just mentioned, uh, the Saudis have behaved towards Qatar very in a very similar fashion that they've, that they've been behaving towards Iran, in fact, even worse so and the starvation that they're imposing on the people of Yemen. And of course, Ansarullah, the reason why they're so successful against the Saudis is because they have popular support. Otherwise, the overwhelming amount of military equipment and hardware that the Saudis have and the money that they spend and the support that they get from the United States and Britain and Canada to slaughter innocents and killing hundreds of thousands of people due to starvation and disease, uh, you know, uh, if they didn't have popular support, they couldn't have. Okay. Been, they couldn't have held the capital for almost three years okay. now. But might, so might obviously it be, might the it be Saudis defensive? have failed, but they've imposed starvation Certainly. on all the different sects in Yemen. Okay, so might it be defensive from their perspective? Let's think about it from their perspective for a second. They look at the Iranians backing Assad. They look at more than 300,000 people dead by barrel bombs, by mortars, by starvation, as you mentioned, and all manner of heinous crimes as well. Hezbollah doing its thing as a militia, not only in, in Lebanon, it's a part of the government, but also a militia, but in Syria as well. Shia militias, which have documented crimes against Iraqi civilians as well. So from their perspective, they're seeing that they have to have a kind of Sunni NATO because they see Iran having a kind of Shia NATO developing no, over the no, years, and they find themselves having to defend No, themselves. first of all, the, no, first of all, what you're saying about Syria, if, if, if they had not helped create the civil war in Syria in the first place, we wouldn't have these dead people. So they violated international, they and the Americans, they created the civil war. If anyone has blood on his, his hands, it's Obama and the people that he's led, first and foremost. In, 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 in other countries, there has been internal strife, but in no country as in Syria did foreign powers try to bring in tens of thousands of people to destroy the country. So uh, the, the, the true criminal in all this is that country that disregarded international law, brought in tens of thousands of extremist fighters, including from Europe and the, and the United States, including from Saudi Arabia and other countries, and demolished so much of the country. And the Iranians have not only supported the Syrian government, they've supported the Palestinian groups like Lewa al-Quds in, in uh, Syria, which have helped to defend the country against the extremists. The Iranians supported the Kurds in Iraq, which are predominantly Sunni. It, when Arbil was about to fall by, through uh, an ISIS attack, it was Iran that went and saved the city. So I think the reality on the ground is very different from the Western propaganda that we hear. Saudi Arabia is, yes, a, it, use sect, it uses sectarianism, but the regime is utterly corrupt. They're billionaire princes who've been taking the wealth of the country for decades, and they use Wahhabism as a facade to distract attention of, away from what they do, and they use the money also to prevent the UN and human rights organizations from pointing out the atrocities, the extraordinary atrocities that they are carrying out in Yemen, which I think is, are, are unprecedented in recent human history. Okay. Where Let's such a large, millions of people are being forced to starve okay. in a man-made starvation. It is a, it is a terrible humanitarian situation, and undoubtedly the Saudi-led coalition must answer for a lot of what's happening on the ground there in Yemen. Aisha, let me bring you in here and back to looking at this coalition of 40 countries, right? What I struggle to understand is, how does it actually work? Who con contributes troops? Do you organize an army when there needs to be an intervention? How's it gonna work? I think the details have yet not been worked out. Uh, there are people there, there are, there are going to be, uh, you know, troops, small numbers from uh, member countries, but who's going to lead? Of course, we have the general, the Pakistani general there. Uh, I think they haven't put the force together. There is a lot of training to be done. There is a synergy to be built, uh, you know, an organizational structure that has to be created. So we are uh, still a way away from having a force which actually works and delivers. Um, the problem is that these details are not being worked out. There is absolute lack of clarity. Uh, I mean, what is being discussed in Riyadh is being kept in in a very small circle. 
uh, I mean, a few weeks ago when there was this conference uh, in Riyadh uh, of this Islamic NATO, so to speak, um, the people who were brought in from Pakistan were those who are very close to the military. So the idea, what I'm trying to say is that, so the myth that is being built around this force mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, whatever is uh, the narrative that is being generated is very controlled. Uh, and so there are very little questions asked. Uh, that needs to be, the details need to be worked out. And a lot depends on what Saudi uh, ambitions are. I mean, we know that ultimately when push comes to shove, uh, there is dependence, Saudi dependence on this force. I mean, if there is an attack from from uh, uh, from Yemen, but very recently there was an attack, there was a missile which was intercepted uh, very close to Riyadh. So there, there is a real threat to Saudi uh, security. So how far will these different militaries that are being have been contributed by the respective countries, how far will they go? Will they cross over into Yemen? Uh, you know, considering that right now, uh, you know, the, the Saudi focus of uh, threat to their security is is right. from Yemen. So, or, or Iran, how far, what lines are there? Who's willing to cross those right. lines? Um, you know, there's a lot of, of gray areas. Mohammed Marandi, would Iran be upset with countries that they have decent bilateral agreements with and a decent sort of diplomatic uh, connection with, who have signed up to be a part of the 40 countries? Does it complicate their business with them? Well, I don't think many of these countries are seriously a part of this, Will. I, I just returned from Turkey, and the mood in Turkey is very hostile towards Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And the fact that the Saudis have been almost completely silent and indifferent to what has just happened with Jerusalem or Al-Quds and the effective uh, uh, annexation uh, by the city uh, through a decree from Trump, uh, the, the mood in Turkey is, is not at all favorable towards Saudi Arabia. And that indeed is a question that I think should be asked. And, and that is that the Saudis have bought, purchased so much weaponry and they've been massacring so many people in Yemen, occupying Bahrain, trying to strangle Matar. What are they going to do for Palestine? What are they going to do for the Palestinians? What are they going to do about Jerusalem. These are our questions. If it is such a, a, a powerful country, if it's interested in Sunni Islam, if it's interested in the Arabs, then what is it going to do about Palestine? Why is it so close to the Israeli regime behind the scenes? So no, I don't think that this alliance is, is a serious alliance at all. I don't think it is important. I think the real questions that the Saudis uh, have to ask themselves is that how long do they think this, that their regime is going to last by carrying out all these different acts and losing across the board. Well, let's get the Saudi perspective from Manama by Mohammed Al Yahya. He's a Middle East fellow at the Atlantic Council, an American think tank focusing on international affairs. Mohammed, I'm glad you listened to the conversation. I know you've got a lot to say. On the one hand, we've had skepticism, I guess, from the Pakistani perspective and downright dismissiveness from the Iranian perspective. They say Saudi Arabia is covering up its crimes, it's promoting sectarianism. This won't work. What do you have to say to that? When it comes to understanding what the, uh, the coalition sets out to achieve, I think the other guests uh, uh, didn't understand exactly uh, what the mandate is. This isn't uh, a coalition built uh, uh, to fight a conventional war with Iran. Uh, Pakistan is not going to be pushed in a, uh, put in a position where it has to choose sides uh, or anything uh, like that. If this were a coalition to counter Iran, countries like Oman or Malaysia uh, or Turkey or Qatar for that matter, and these countries uh, have either good relations with Iran or very neutral relations with Iran, these people wouldn't be part of a coalition uh, uh, like this. Now, uh, uh, the question as to whether Iran uh, uh, should be in the coalition um, uh, or not uh, is very simple. Uh, uh, Iran's uh, uh, foreign policy uh, uh, is hinged uh, in many ways on supporting uh, uh, terrorist groups. Now, Iranians will come back and say that Hezbollah, for example, is not designated by the Iranians as a terrorist group, that uh, the dozens of Shia militias in Iraq that it supports are not uh, uh, terrorist groups, that the Afghanis and Pakistanis, the uh, Fatimi Yun and Zainab Yun in Syria that it's sending are not terrorist groups. But there's an even, an even bigger problem here, which is that uh, Iran is a main state sponsor of Sunni terrorism. 
Uh, there are countless examples of Iran providing material support to Al-Qaeda. Take, for example, the 2000 USS coal bombing. Uh, a court in the United States uh, 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 made it very clear that Iran was, was uh, implicated in, in creating Al-Qaeda in Yemen, founding Al-Qaeda in Yemen, cultivating Al-Qaeda in Yemen. So it's not just support for uh, the Houthis in Yemen. And, and contrary to what your guest mentioned, the Houthis actually have zero support, zero grassroots support uh, beyond their own uh, 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 constituency in, in Yemen, and that is their constituency in, in Sa'da. Uh, so when you come uh, to look at the Islamic coalition, uh, uh, not including Iran, it's very simple. Uh, uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, uh, agents that are in Iran, uh, Iran today are like uh, Hamza bin Laden. Uh, there are people like Abu Khair al-Masri, Saif al-Adl. Saif al-Adl made the call uh, uh, for the 1996 Riyadh bombings from Tehran. Uh, it's been reported that in 2014 there was a, a, a prisoner swap deal whereby Al-Qaeda in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Yemen released uh, an Iranian diplomat in exchange for these uh, 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 harbored Iranian terrorists in uh, Iran. But the reports also say that uh, Saif al-Adl remains in okay. uh, Iran so let me until ask you today. This. Okay, fair if enough. Iran and wants to be, no, but uh, just to, to add Hold one on. thing, to add one thing, if, if Iran would like to be part of a coalition like this, it should show... Uh, 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 confidence building measures. Okay, okay. At least be transparent. Okay, Where is Saif al-Adl? Where is Hamza bin Laden? You, let me you know, then uh, ask you the, about uh, their name. Abu, Abu Mus'ab al-Zarqawi was in Iran, okay. and the Jordanians were asking for his extradition for years, and okay. the Iranians didn't And they have uh, an argument that, that the, the current CIA so documents in the United States Muhammad. show it. P primarily, it's because Iran is, is uh, uh, supporting al-Qaeda. Okay, and, and they have an argument that Saudi Arabia, if not directly supports al-Qaeda and other Salafi jihadi groups, it provides the ideological fountain for everything that transpires after that. That's their argument. Let me then ask you a separate question, and it will be my final question because I have to move on. What about the Iraqis? If the very uh, foundation of this organization was fighting Daesh, no country was hit harder than Iraq when you look at what Daesh has done in the region. Yes, they're a fragile state. Yes, they've had some sectarian militias that have committed atrocities. But Iraq has been battered by Daesh. Half of their country was almost swallowed up by Daesh. Yet the Saudi-led coalition has not invited them to be a part of the 40-nation country. Why? Is it because they're led by Shias? It's not because they're led uh, by Shias. Uh, first of all, we have to differentiate between uh, the Saudis' uh, bilateral relationship with Iraq and uh, uh, the politics of this uh, Islamic coalition. Saudi bilateral relations with Iraq have improved to a great extent uh, 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 recently. The idea of institutionalizing the Hashd al-Shaabi, removing the IRGC's direct influence over these groups, and, and there are several of these groups within the Hashd al-Shaabi that are as barbaric as ISIS. Take Abu Azrael, for example, uh, of the Imam Ali brigades. This is somebody who hung uh, an alleged ISIS fighter uh, above a bonfire and started cutting him up like a kebab. There is no difference between the barbarism of some of these, uh, some of the elements within the Hashd al-Shaabi and ISIS. The idea is to institutionalize uh, the Hashd al-Shaabi, to make it an Iraqi force uh, uh, that is not supported uh, by the IRGC, that's not manipulated by the IRGC, and to that end, uh, Saudi-Iraqi bilateral relationships, uh, relationship and, and, and Iraq's relationship with the Gulf uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, focused on, 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 on supporting that. You know, what, what needs to happen in Iraq is that uh, uh, the state has to have a monopoly on the use of force, needs to be able to control its borders. This is something the Iranians don't want. The Iranians benefit from being able to use uh, uh, the Iraqi border to transfer weapons, uh, cash, uh, uh, and advisors to Hezbollah uh, via, via Iraq and via Syria. For, for uh, the Iraqi government to have a monopoly on the use of force, for it to have control over its borders and be able to decide whether to allow Iran uh, to make uh, such transfers is something that the Iranians don't want to happen. This is a risk for them long term. And this is what the, the, the Gulf countries are trying okay. to help the Iraqi government do. Okay. Mohammed al Yahya, I think it's been really important to get the Saudi perspective. And I'm glad you joined us. Thank you very much for joining us, Mohammed al Yahya from Manama. Thank you.